Hey everyone, it's Friday and we are back with another episode 185 of the 65 podcast. I am the co-host in chief today, the main pilot, not the co-pilot. That's going to be Mr. Patrick Moorhead. Yes, I did that. Yes, I did that because I had to do that because we're going to do that here on the show today because we did a lot of co-piloting this week. Pat, how you doing, buddy? Man, I'm doing great. Three events, both coasts, uh, 13 videos. Uh, I'm just feeling glad to be alive. I can't believe we're back in Austin. So we started off. How do you do that? How do you, how do, you do a, a three events in three cities that all required flights, none of which are nearby, and yet still be home to work a full slate on Friday? And you work during the day and you fly during the night. It's very simple. That's what you do, and that's what we do. We are committed to not just having one job, but having two jobs. I, I think I'm analyst by day, uh, six five by night. I think I'm up to like twelve jobs, dude. I, I cannot, for the life of me, figure out how I could work more hours. I can't because I need to because I'm not getting enough done. I, uh, you know, I love weeks like this because they fly by. We saw so many of our customers. We had great conversations, uh, had a chance to reconnect, connect, rekindle, inspire. Um, and like you said, we really did kind of wear the, uh, we wore the two hats, you know, we wore the um, analyst advisor hat that we do with our two firms, more insights and strategy in the future and group. And then we put on our joint hat, the six, five, and, you know, we, uh, we did what we like to do. You know, we came for the news and we, uh, we gave the world the analysis. And I'm going to stick with that theme until it sticks, buddy. But, uh, hey, we got a great week. Uh, big show. Um, so much ground to cover. We were uh, at Oracle Cloud World. We were at Intel um, Innovation. We were at, and by the way, that you, you, you're even figuring out a way to squeeze seven topics in. You're, you're, making, you're making orange juice over uh, here. Seven, right? se seven companies. Seven. That's and by, by the way, it's going to be more than that because we're going to squeeze probably some talk about Splunk in there maybe. And that's yeah. not technically on there. And we might talk about NVIDIA when we talk about GPUs and new PCs. And yeah, anyways, bottom line is we've got a lot to cover this week. If this is the first time that you've ever watched the podcast, I'm going to ask you why it's the first time you've ever watched this because it's the best. But in all serious, the 6.5 is six topics, five to 10 minutes each, usually closer to 10. Um, and that's because Pat talks a lot. But every once in a while, I get I get a word in edge wide. That's a joke. That's a Friday joke. Look at Pat. He's all offended. He's probably going to probably... I'm not even going to get a smile. Just smile, look offended to you, buddy. Yeah, you, you know, you know how it goes. Because I, I'm generally my brevity is well, well documented, and you know, it's like, anyways, um, we're going to cover a lot of ground. But if it is the first time, make sure it's not the last. Stick with us often. We are uh, for information and entertainment purposes only. And while we do talk about publicly traded companies, please not take anything we say as investment advice. So we're going to talk Oracle Cloud World. We're going to talk Intel Innovation. We're going to talk Microsoft's AI event in New York City. We're also going to talk about a $28 billion deal that we all knew was going to happen. We just didn't know when. We're going to get a little geeky and talk about a cool new foldable 17-inch device that Pat probably has and I wish I had. And then we're going to make fun of Apple. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to talk a little bit about... <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about Qualcomm and Apple. And don't, 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 uh, don't be discouraged by our our infinite jealousy of Apple. Um, <laughs> it just is what it is. But uh, anyway, so let's let's get started. Let's dive in. Let the comedy hour end. Let's let the analysis begin. Patrick Moorhead, kick us off. Oracle Cloud World. Lots to cover there. Yeah. So Oracle uh, is such a diverse company. I mean, not only are they uh, SaaS. Uh, and still have even on-prem apps and on-prem databases, but they also have uh, IaaS and cloud infrastructure and they have traditional infrastructure. So such a, a diverse uh, company, you know, Dan, five years ago, people were wondering, you know, what is this company going to do? They're, they're kind of the old, you know, the old tech company and uh, to their credit, just, just come uh, uh, storming uh, back. And, you know, for, uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, Steve Miranda uh, got up, he runs uh, Oracle Fusion uh, apps. And 
uh, announced exactly what you'd expect, right? Three uh, generative AI, um, actually, you know, uh, two generative AI features and a new data platform uh, for generative AI and brought a bunch of partners on kind of singing the praise of it. Here's what I loved is, uh, is Stephen uh, went off script uh, and I think it just shows the kind of company that, that Oracle is <laughs> and the customers like talking about, you know, didn't believe anything <laughs> that, that the salespeople said and, you know, uh, the implementation uh, was a challenge, uh, but they got through that. And I really appreciate that because Dan, you know, you and I sit uh, in in the audience, just like you know, watching these customer stories, and they've got nothing. They have no constructive criticism, and and to me, it comes off fake. This came off very genuine. A uh, key message uh, sent out. This was to less about I think picking up market share, more about getting the installed base of customers to go in and dive into these generative AI features. Uh, and also those customers who might be still on-prem, right, with some of their features to uh, uh, to get uh, uh, in the cloud. So uh, this is gonna go long, isn't it? <laughs> no, man, you've-, you've No, I'm gonna you move got, this forward. Got, so a uh, new future data intelligence platform, right? It combines the data models, the AI ML, analytics, uh, and apps, I think what we've seen over the last nine months is you have to have the models close to the data. And this is this is uh, what that does. And, and while most uninformed people think analytics are going away, uh, that is ridiculous because technology is additive. We have analytics, ML, DL, and of course, uh, generative AI uh, features. And, and finally, you know, Steve rolled out uh, multiple generative AI features across every part of their uh, portfolio, ERP, SCM, CX, sales, marketing, pretty much pretty much across the in, entire gambit. And while I don't think this is as many features, uh, the Oracle strategy is to put up, you know, not the 100 features that 10 will get used, but put in the 20 to 30 features that they know that their customers need and can activate that data and either save money or or make or, or drive uh, more uh, revenue. OCI, uh, big uh, victory lap on Heatwave Lakehouse. Very simple. You put MySQL in memory and is going to be really fast. Okay. Why the other vendors can't do this, I don't know. Uh, I love the uh, the middle finger. Uh, charts uh, showing Redshift, uh, Databricks, Snowflake, uh, Google BigQuery. I'm a fan of Google BigQuery, but when you pack my SQL into memory, it is just going to be fast. Final comment uh, on OCI. I'll, uh, I'm leaving you a lot here, uh, Dan. Uh, very interesting. Uh, they had Ampere on on stage, and they're an ARM-based data center processor play, and um, couple announcements there. Uh, first off, Clay McGurick, who runs OCI for Oracle, said 95% of OCI plus new Fusion customers run on Ampere computing. That was a mind-blowing moment, right? I know, you know, you whispered uh, to me or asked me, hey, you know, wonder what that means to revenue. It, it, it when, we were, <laughs> when we were watching this, uh, Oracle is a huge investor and I think has invested billions into Ampere. Uh, all I know is that it has to be a, a bunch and I'm sure we could spreadsheet uh, this out, but I'll wait to do that. Dan, I left you a, a ton of content here. Uh, the Microsoft stuff, uh, go for it. Listen, um, because there was so much going on, I wanna just kind of boil it down to a couple of themes. The company, and this was really well articulated by Clay McGurk, but the full stack is really when you can take together the infrastructure layer and tie it to enterprise applications and industry applications. And what does that mean? Well, you know, there's the concept of building apps that are very specific to a use case in industries, financial services, uh, supply chain use cases. And then there's the actual applications for enterprise, which is ERP, CRM, all the things that we kind of regularly talk about. What Oracle has done that's very, very interesting and kind of has quietly happened is it's really created this 
this virtuous circle of completeness in its offering that you can argue no one else, maybe Microsoft is doing this, but Microsoft doesn't have the traditional core ERP database um, at nearly the scale that Oracle does. And the reason I point this out is Oracle is kind of increasingly becoming this uh, gelatinous blob of capability to serve the entire enterprise. Hey, Dan, can you write a paper on that for me? Called the gelatinous blob. Gelatinous blob. blob. <laughs> no, listen, just stick with me now. You've no, got no, your point is spot database. on. You've your, got your point is spot on. Hyperscale cloud art infrastructure. You've got yeah. partnerships and peering uh, globally with leading uh, infrastructure companies. You've got platforms. You've got uh, like Cerner, an industry-focused application that is basically one of a very small number of apps that's globally used, compliant um, for highly regulated industries that ties together that enterprise app, that industry app, and plus the infrastructure layer. And this has been this has been um, visible in the company's recent performance and its growth. It is the fastest growth infrastructure play right now. Yeah, it is. It's had strong growth across cloud, but the infrastructure number has grown very, very quickly. So Clay rightfully did his victory lap. And let's face it, you know, I know we talked about this last week, but seeing Satya Nadella, who, by the way, had a nice chat with you and I yesterday, we should put that photo up. Um, but seeing just, Satya just, Nadella, just, just the two of us, of course. It was just the two of us and a couple people behind us. Um, <laughs> But also sitting down with Larry and, and literally coming together and saying, look, we sort of know the world is, is hybrid multi. Pat, we've been saying this for a little while. Uh, we understand that we have customers that might see uh, more benefit in one public cloud or another, but we wanna bring the highest performance utilization of, of, of Oracle, regardless of which cloud it's in. And at the same time, we wanna make an attractive reason for these two companies to be cross-selling and obviously, there's got to be a reason those two want to work together. There's someone they're collectively chasing, maybe, out there. Um, and, and the only other thing I'll leave, and then we'll move on from this, is the the I did want to give a shout out to Steve Zavanik and his team. We've worked closely with, we went to the database summit momentarily, and their numbers, the MySQL heatwave numbers are just mind-boggling, the performance. Yeah. Um, and I think people have kind of not noticed maybe at scale, how much it is outperforming all of its peers right now. And that's put a lot of pressure. It'll pressure innovation from the other hyperscalers. But it also is probably part of the reason that if latency and query speed and all that stuff is a priority, Oracle's got a compelling uh, story right now. And if you run if you run Oracle on Oracle, in Oracle, you're going to get the absolute best of breed performance, which maybe you could call that an attempt to get lock-in, or maybe you could just call that an attempt to build the best solution for customers. So you can look yeah, at it across the continuum. Yeah, good analysis, Dan. You know, one thing we never talk about is the cost base of fusion, right? You have uh, Salesforce, right? And ServiceNow who have to sit on, on, they have to pay an AWS or an Azure or somebody uh, to do all this goodness. So there gotta be some cost advantages uh, in there uh, as well, well I think, think we saw some companies like Zoom make big commitments to Oracle over the years because I think they were looking at those potential cost efficiencies. All right, we we could go on this one for a while. Um, this is why we call it the Six Ten Podcast, and we hope everybody appreciates. There's so much analysis here to do, but let's move on to the Microsoft AI and Surface event. Pat, we brought the Six Five. We brought the analysis. Um, first of all, just a really good event. I love these kind of pop up one day, high impact, lots of announcements, big mix of media personalities, analysts, executives, a lot of access. And when I say a lot of access, Pat, um, you know, first time what in five years that Satya sat down and really did an in-depth conversation with the analysts here it was amazing. And not only did he sit down, but he was very engaged, connected and, 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 and grateful, which I love. Um, and, and gave us a lot of great feedback, Pat. And we covered the gamut of hybrid on-premise data. You asked a great question. Uh, I think you. you got great question twice in one answer from him. So that was the most great question that he gave to anybody. Um, all the way to, you know, where I was asking him about regulatory and policy. And he really gave us a very, uh, you know, 
succinct uh, feedback on all of that. But moreover, let's talk about what got announced. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about the co-pilots, Pat, and I'll leave you to talk about the devices a little bit maybe. And obviously, it's much as you want to talk about the co-pilots. But, you know, we're entering an era where, you know, we need to bring simplicity and we need to bring um, generative AI value to our organizations. We've been hyping and talking, and Microsoft has been at the forefront since November of last year when ChatGPT hit. It made its early announcements. Pat, we were in Redmond beginning of the year. We heard about the first Bing uh, with, with GPT inside of it. And, and then it started moving through the M365. It started moving into Edge and, and, and Windows 11. It started moving into productivity tools. And of course, D365, we're going to see co-pilots in everything. But really, the idea is a co-pilot for everyone. And it's kind of starting off with a co-pilot for the consumer and a co-pilot for the enterprise. Uh, and then as we, as we move forward, and this was something I'm very interested in, we're going to start to see Microsoft really attempting to deliver a co-pilot for your life which is gonna blend the physical and, 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 and work and digital and consumer experiences together. And yesterday was really a moment where we saw some GA happen. I think one of the biggest announcements, the ones that I got most excited about was the co-pilot going GA for um, M365 and your productivity suite. Pat, I have been waiting to try this. Um, I know mm -hmm. I believe I'm really influential, but they did not let me have it. <laughs> So, so my ego has been in a has been in a cobweb uh, in the corner of the office for a while, but my ego is coming back because I'm going to be building PowerPoints in two seconds when it's going to be able to read my mind. Um, and Pat, another thing is I, I loved was the Outlook tool, the Sound Like Me tool that was announced yesterday. I don't know if anybody knows, but I really love the way I write. Um, in case, I, I'm I'm kidding today. I'm just feeling spunky, but. Um, the idea of a lot of generated text is, you know, you read it, Pat. We've talked about some analysts that probably shouldn't be proud of the fact that they do most of their writing with ChatGPT or other tools now. Um, I call them, Gross. they're just tools, period. But the idea of, of it being inspirational is great. But what about the idea of it being inspirational and then being on tone to sound like you? Yeah. When I write an email, there's a way that I address people. There is a way that I, um, you know, I, I, I send off people. There is kind of an inflection that I use inside of my, um, in my, in my writing that right now when I use tools to look at, it doesn't sound anything like that. And that's mostly been testing for me, Pat. But the idea that we could have these tools sound just like us with the click of a button is very, very cool to me. Um, so yesterday was, but in my opinion, was really all about, I, I put out a tweet kind of like a too long, don't read. And I said it was all about kind of the democratization of the co-pilot for, you know, bringing the co-pilot to the person. And that's really what happened yesterday, whether you're in Windows, in, in, in whether you're in the Edge browser, whether you're in the applications. And Microsoft really showed its hand that it's going to move from the consumer edge of the browser and Windows all the way to the enterprise edge of your dynamics and of your enterprise search. And, and I felt that, Pat, that that was a really powerful point. You know, we had some good time with the leadership team. We're not just Satya. We got face to face with fellows. We got face to face with heads of Surface, heads of um, AI strategy. Pat, a lot of talk about responsible AI. Um, and so I'm going to leave it there. Let you kind of chime in here. Um, it was a really exciting. I I don't know. I left energized. Although I won't lie, I did fall asleep on the flight home. Uh, I was exhausted. Well, after all that New York uh, Delhi stuff, I I would totally understand that. It's like a four pound turkey sandwich and. You know, yeah. I ate yours too. I know, half of it. Well, so, hungry. you know, Satya did a really good job kicking it off, really making the case for this being a new uh, category, new interface, new reasoning engine equals new uh, category. And if you look at how long that we've been using keyboard and mouse uh, to get in there <laughs> and trackpad, it, uh, I think he has a good, a good case. And I don't think he stretched it uh, a too far uh, at all. Uh, like you said, really the punchline of the event was Copilot, right? One experience, uh, two products, uh, one experience. And this cuts across consumer and uh, businesses. And, and I think this is a, a differentiator. They're the only company at scale who is doing this uh, for, for both right now. And, you know, there's a lot of arguments uh, for Google and and what they're doing they don't touch as many uh businesses but they touch more consumers uh, i expect apple to show up at some point 
and they're primarily a, a con consumer play. Uh, one thing that a lot of people missed, because uh, I saw, you know, some of the coverage from from some of the press, it's like, you know, way to hold a hold of event a, an event for nearly no new products in in GA for Microsoft 365. This capability is now embedded into Windows, and uh, it's uh, adding generative AI capabilities into Photos. It's adding generative AI uh, AI into uh, things like uh, ClipChamp which is so easy, I might actually use to get uh, some of my videos and content onto, uh, onto Instagram. And I think that's what people missed, a, a, a black and white upgrade and big image creator using Dolly 3. I mean, uh, I, I was not that impressed. I probably wouldn't have used much of the content that came out of uh, the original Bing uh, image creator, but I can see myself using this one uh, now. Looked great. It did. It, it did look phenomenal. And, and you know, the first version, right, this just came with Dolly. You know, faces were weird. Hands were weird. Humans were weird. Yeah. And I, I think I saw enough uh, to know that this is um, going to be different. Uh, Surface, may, uh, Surface, new Surface uh, devices surfaced as well, right? And, and I think the one that I'm most excited about, and probably you, because you carry this as your, as your, as your daily go-to, is the laptop top studio. I carry a 15 inch uh, surface, but um, I just really enjoyed some of the usage scenarios running circles around the MacBook Pro and uh, M2 Max. Uh, they did a, a visual uh, imaging demo and it, it lapped the uh, MacBook by three to four X as they were running uh, a Llama 2 instance. Uh, I love that stuff and really gave us a peek uh, to what the next generation of generative AI experiences are going to be. Some of those experiences will be delivered through the cloud, primarily delivered through the cloud. Some of them will be primarily delivered on the client computer, and some will be a hybrid mixture uh, of those. So I like their strategy. Again, huge Azure, huge capabilities huge SaaS, uh, particularly on the uh, the personal productivity side, uh, and then very big capabilities. And, you know, these Windows capabilities are, are not just on Surface, they're in other brands as well as provided by the Windows uh, operating system. Uh, great stuff. I want to follow up uh, on, on my one question I got uh, with Satya. Uh, if we've ever been at an event together, right, I, I'm, or a big part of my research is that I'm trying to get my head around is public cloud is 14 years old and uh, first AWS service was uh, 2009. It was a queuing service, yet 75 to 90% of enterprise data is still on-prem or in devices and not in the cloud. So uh, how does anybody uh, activate uh, these types of experiences if you've got to have access to the data and you either have to infer on it you have to train on it uh, at a minimum you have to um, uh, prompt against it and you know one way to do it is send it up to the cloud and, and that's what we've seen in these first level experience but i asked him what is your strategy uh, with this in mind and Net Netty said, Microsoft is going to activate the data wherever it sits. And he cited uh, the Oracle database at Azure uh, as a good example. He cited some things that, that I took as Azure uh, stack. And if I read between the lines of his response, I wish I would have recorded it, I saw little uh, pieces of federated learning. And federated learning is, is doing the activation wherever the data is. Uh, they have Azure Stack uh, as well, which uh, is, is, is I find. Uh, so that's one thing I'm going to keep uh, my eyes on. But Satya seemed very confident in his uh, responses uh, to me on that. Yeah, and uh, just a quick boomerang because we got to keep moving here. But the idea of a natural language interface and reasoning engine was a big takeaway here. And this was kind of my 
Shazam moment is the human machine era begins when we are able to naturally interface with the machine and the machine understands and reasons with us in a way that feels empathic and human. And as you tie these things together, it gets really interesting and really uh, exciting, Pat. So we've got a lot of topics left. I know we can spend, God, it's going to have to change like the 620. We're going to need to start doing two hour Fridays. Hey, Let's talk about keep, uh, if we keep flagellating ourselves about uh, how long it is and get to it, maybe we'll get through this. Hey, hey, I want to do the you 630. Know? Maybe it's my favorite thing to do. Why do you, you guys ruin my fun? I want it to be three hours long. Okay. All right. <laughs> all good, man. Let's talk innovation. Yeah. So Intel Innovation, uh, we spent uh, about a day and a half there uh, meeting with executives, going to keynotes, and of course, uh, knocking out seven uh, on on-site videos. So uh, I always like a combination of thought leadership and, and product launches and having run thought leadership uh, at, at a certain chip company, I can appreciate uh, good stuff and, and stuff that's not good. And I really appreciated that uh, CEO Pat Gelsinger started off with this notion of the, the SIL economy, right? Defined as an evolving economy enabled by the magic of silicon or semis are essential to maintaining and enabling modern economies. And, you know, it's funny, uh, uh, he could have done this two years ago, right? When we were, you know, not shipping $100,000 cars because of a five cent chip. Uh, but right now, front and center with the lack of uh, ability for NVIDIA uh, to be able to ship uh, uh, silicon. But his macro point was how it makes economies and it, it, uh, it builds uh, culture in a way that oil uh, used to uh, before. So I really like that. Some of the biggest announcements, uh, an Intel developer cloud, um, uh, essentially, you know, the unique part of this is whether it's CPU, GPU, uh, NPU, uh, or even an FPGA uh, using a similar uh, set of APIs and developer tools to, to do what you want, and that's to uh, accelerate. Uh, to my surprise, it's not just for developer, but you can actually run. In fact, we interviewed two customers that were running production workloads uh, on that. Uh, Pat also coined uh, the term AIPC uh, at the event. He did allude to it in his previous uh, uh, earnings, uh, but uh, he showed not only uh, benchmarks uh, with the what he called the VPU, which is a discrete solution. Uh, but he also uh, gave a flash to the next generation, actually two generations of, of silicon where he was running uh, stable diffusion, uh, uh, music, uh, uh, music generation. So this is going to heat up, right? With Qualcomm leaning into this and, and Intel leaning into this and AMD leaning into this, I think in Microsoft, as we saw, uh, something big could happen and this could mean a, a rebirth or another a mega cycle in uh, PC upgrades. Uh, I'll leave, leave you some oxygen here. Uh, final thing that came on my radar is uh, Intel's uh, fifth generation uh, Sierra Forest demo, uh, which comes out in 2024. They had originally said it was 144 core solution in one part. It's actually 288. Uh, that, that's the old Intel that, that I know and didn't always love, right, when I was competing with them or, or even their customer. But that's a classic Intel move. Uh, Look, so, it's twins. No, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, what's the one thing that uh, Intel CEO Pat G brought on uh, the 6.5 was that he loved, he loved that. Uh, absolutely. How about the glass substrate? That was pretty fun. I was going to leave that for you, uh, but I'll follow up with, I do have to do research on this 288 core uh, deal. Um, I need to know the power. I need to know the bandwidth. Uh, you have to, if you can't feed the cores with the memory, it's not necessarily going to be doing uh, what you want to do. And wow, it does include hyper threading too. So 288 uh, cores, 576 threads. I think most of the cloud folks will turn uh, hyper-threading off for, uh, for QoS, but it's there if you're looking for a, uh, a beast. Yeah, I'm going to 
I want to take a little bit of a different lens here. The innovation event is a developer event and it's focused on making that connection. Now, if you're following the AI era, what you realize is Pat and I love to say you can't, uh, you know, silicon or semiconductors will eat the world or rule the world or whichever way we want to say it. And that's because you can't run software on air. The reason developers show up at silicon events is because they understand they can't actually develop software if they don't have the memory, the cores, thread, all the things that Pat loves, loves to talk about. I, yeah. I, I can't, I can't, you know, Pat G and Pat M actually, you both big P and little P, you both love talking about this stuff. And and, and my point is, is, you know, you kind of go, why are developers at a, at a silicon conference? Well, same thing with NVIDIA, you know, and NVIDIA has been able to change the sort of perception of the company by saying, we're not a silicon company, we're a software company. And in many ways, uh, Intel is very, very actively trying to change that same perception. You know, whether that's its developer cloud, um, you know, where it's been partnering. And Pat, we talked to some really interesting companies that are building and developing with Intel, uh, next generation AI focused apps. Um, and Intel's been able to really, you know, start to, to talk about, you know, with its, you know, its strategy around one API, open Vino, it's building software tools that are going to, as this AI era proliferates, give flexibility and optionality to the developer community. And this is something that, you know, has been heavily debated. The reason the market doesn't believe companies like AMD and Intel will make a dent in the AI world is that everyone kind of always talks about something called CUDA lock it. Um, it's the, you know, the NVIDIA proprietary software ecosystem that people are developing for AI. But the truth is, is we're starting to see companies, you know, companies going on stage, the Fabletics and other companies that are basically committing long term to building on on. Uh, Intel Silicon. The other thing too is, is that we are seeing this kind of shift where people I think are starting to see that when all this training bonanza comes to a, the foregone conclusion, and it will happen, I don't know if it's four, six, eight quarters into the future, but I promise you this unbelievable growth rate um, on these high-end GPUs will slow at some point when you know all these large hyperscale scalers have deployed their required infrastructure to train their large and, and, and mid-sized models. It's not gonna end, it's just, this, it's gonna slow. And then what ends up happening though is a lot of this compute shifts to these other architectures that Pat Gelsinger talked a lot about here. You know, Intel is you know, not yet able to compete at the high end of discrete GPU with, with, uh, with what NVIDIA is doing, but with its A6, with Gaudi 2, um, with you know, some of its, its Xeon core processing for inference on database and, and whatnot, which is something they've talked about for a long time. A lot of the inferencing is what's gonna come out of all this training. So all these apps that we wanna run on the edge or these AI PCs, um, it's gonna be NPU driven, it's gonna be core CPU driven, it's going to be, you know, for data center applications, it's gonna be driven by traditional core uh, Xeon. Uh, and, and Intel has a big role to play there. And so, you kind of see the cycling of the everything runs on silicon and the developers want to build apps that are going to be usable and you start to see where their role is to play. Now, again, this doesn't mean they're going to grab massive market share in the big data center GPUs the minute they roll one out. But what it means is they're trying to make software easier. They're trying to give developers a playground with their cloud developer um, you know, uh, ecosystem. And they're trying to drive more, de <clears throat> more development on Intel Silicon which in the end is gonna require more utilization and purchasing of silicon, which is a long game. But Intel did show to me, Pat, that they're very much in the AI game. They have a story that's continuing to proliferate. Their five and four you know, is very much close to being in line, which is something you and I both said adamantly is gonna to have to happen. And so it was a, it was a strong overall showing um, from the company. You know, The next few quarters, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and that continued ability to meet the expectations. Um, but the fact that developers are there, developers are hungry to build AI on Intel is a good sign for Intel's longer uh, road ahead. So let's talk about a deal. Sorry, I never do that. I don't know what. Um, so we woke up, Pat, on Thursday morning to announcement that Cisco went back to the well. You remember it was probably about a year ago that there was rumors of Cisco going in to buy Splunk. Um, and now apparently a deal has been reached at around $28 billion 
for this acquisition to take place. Now, at the high level, let's talk about what's happening at Cisco. So CEO Chuck Robbins over the last uh, couple of years has been steadfast that the company needs to shift from a uh, very um, hardware-centric CapEx to a very ARR and software-centric business model. The company has leaned in heavily in security, has leaned in heavily in um, observability. Um, and then, of course, it has its uh, collaboration platforms as well. But these have been the areas where the company had substantial opportunities to grow in software. Well, Splunk sort of is a it's a it's a bifecta. Given the company's interest in both security and the, its interest in observability, um, it you know Thousand Eyes, App D plus Splunk, you now have a very complete observability portfolio, and you've expanded your security. And by the way, bought a company that has made successfully the pivot from traditional software licensing model to an ARR model. And that's been the um, that's really been the directive of leadership. So going back to the Doug Merritt, who we work very closely with at the 6.5, Pat, uh, who was CEO, he started that transition. And then later, Gary, um, when Gary was brought in uh, to lead the, uh, Gary Steele, sorry, Gary Steele, the new CEO was brought in to lead the transformation the rest of the way. We saw the company substantially growing its ARR, substantially growing its recurring um, and its uh, clout business which was very important. So what's Cisco getting? Cisco's getting a significant, one of the leading names in observability to package up with its existing observability portfolio, um, you know, a billion plus of ARR. It's getting a opportunity to quickly become the pretty much undisputed market leader in monitoring and observability across security and IT ops. And it's able to do that by making this acquisition and also giving more value to its shareholders long-term by continuing to pivot the company's revenues to higher ARR and higher cloud numbers and software numbers, which is what Cisco has been promising to the market. So, Pat, this was a kind of a deal I always expected to have happen. I wasn't sure they actually came back richer than the original price tag, but over the four quarters um, since they talked about this, three to four quarters, they also did substantially increase their ARR and their cloud revenue each quarter at Splunk. So that continued to push multiple push value. And I think over the last few weeks, as we've seen IPOs come off, as we've started to see more activity in M&A come off, prices are coming off the bottom. And this was just another indicator that prices are coming off the bottom. I think it's a good move for Cisco. It's a great thing for Splunk. Splunk investors have seen their stock absolutely pummeled and, and held down for a long time. This is going to give a nice return to those that stuck with Splunk for the long run. And I think for Cisco, it helps meet the objective that the company's had, which is that pivot that I've now re-emphasized at least seven times since I started this uh, this little this little diatribe. Wow, Dan, take a breath there. So I'm going to take a, uh, a slightly different uh, tack on here. I don't want to repeat uh, what Daniel says, but that was really smart. So. Uh, a couple mega trends, or actually, I wouldn't call them mega trend. Well, one's a mega trend, uh, which is data management platforms are super important as we get into, you know, I don't want to say the generative AI age, but it, it mattered with AI, it mattered with DL, and it matters with analytics. We're creating so much data that it needs to be tamed and managed, and we talk about getting value from it, and you need to have a data management platform. Uh, and ironically, you know, these were not in NDA Q and A's, but my, my comment to Chuck and his executive team was the one thing you're missing uh, in, in your strategy is a data management platform, right? I like the observability as a service. I like the uh, network networking and security as a service. No, by the way, I really like that it, it crosses any type of cloud. It doesn't matter where your infrastructure is. Cisco is making money all along the way. Uh, maybe I floated uh, Cloud Air to them as well, <laughs> but uh, they opted uh, to 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 do a probably a three x uh, acquisition uh, of 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 Splunk there. And I'm not confused that Cloud Era and and Splunk they do they do very uh, uh, different things. But this just makes sense. The other trend you have going on is that enterprises are sick of having 
uh, 54 different security vendors, right? Uh, over time, all, pretty much all new markets have these best in breed point solutions, okay? That enterprises have to integrate, architect, and keep up with all of the revisions that, uh, that, that go on. The other thing that we've always seen in IT is that that just gets out of hand, right? Because what happens is these quote unquote best in breed, if you're integrating uh, three additions after the new one, you're not actually getting the best bits and you're potentially uh, creating security holes by having this plethora um, of vendors. The other thing is, is the security game has become a data game. And um, I think they say that only 5% of uh, red security issues actually get looked at by a human. It's because there's so many and you have AI coming in to uh, kind of, you know, you get in this spy versus spy situation where humans can't keep up. And the only way that, that, that you can do this is to have a data platform where you're capturing all this data on the security side and you have some, some sort of AI to be able to better figure out what's a red, what's a yellow, and you know what to ignore and what to act upon. And sometimes you act upon it automatically and that's where this market's going. So uh, Cisco is one of the biggest security vendors out there. I think they're number two uh, to Microsoft's, uh, number one, this, this makes sense. Uh, I need to think a little bit about the, uh, the market concentration of this, uh, for regulators. But last time I checked observability is a very fractalized market where, uh, concentration levels, uh, aren't exactly that high, but in the end, all depends how the regulators want to define market. And, 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 and we will see, I have, I, I've seen no articles, I've seen no analysis that said, this is gonna be a regular regulatory uh, challenge, but it does need to go through the regulatory process. Yeah, I don't see it being a challenge at all. That's good insights though, Pat, for sure. Um, let's, let's get a little, let's get, let's get into the mud a bit <clears throat> here I'm, 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 and get to a product. We, Gosh, Dan, this is much you call Oracle this bloated, uh, homogenous. Say bloated? Come <laughs> on, man! I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a nasty gram about that. I said it's a, I don't know, I can't remember what I said, but it said it's like an amorphous blob. It's a, it's a, <laughs> but it's like growing. Amorphous and blob. It's and, and, but anyways, yeah. let's let's talk some men. Uh, let's talk some cool next generation hardware from HP. Yeah, so there's very few pieces of new PC hardware that I lust after, but I lust after this one. I've never used it. I've never held it. And by the way, I never do that either, but I, but I have to have this. Okay, this is a 17-inch 3-in-1. It's a 3-in-1 is it in, in, in that you can use it with a keyboard uh, and have the full 17-inch, uh, 17 inches of glory. Uh, you can also turn it on a side and you can use part of the display uh, as uh, as a keyboard. And of course, if you want to do the tent mode, you can do that too. So um, I really like, by the way, I want this. It's only a mere $5,000. HP, uh, can you hear me out there? I'd love to uh, demo this uh, uh, for you. But uh, they also went out of their way to... I would say fix some of the things that are just so annoying with some of these foldable devices. So first of all, keyboard in the bag magnetically connects and it connects out of the box without having to mess with Bluetooth. I love that. Comes with a pen. You're probably going to use this with a pen. If you ever use a pen for any drawing comes in there and you don't have to, you don't have to set it up. It also comes in uh, with an adapter. Right, if you want to set this up on a on a bigger display, so it's literally all there. It's five thousand dollars, but it's coming uh, with hundreds of dollars of um, hundreds of dollars worth of accessories that 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 makes this uh, make sense. By the way, pull that back. It doesn't do tent mode. The third orientation is to have the the magnetic keyboard in front, and then you're looking down at a display, and then you're looking up at a at a second display. 
Uh, I can't live with, with less than two displays when I'm doing any type of work that's meaningful. I have four displays right now, one behind me, on the right, in front of me, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and on the left. So, you know, we talk about what's going to drive the next super cycle. Uh, three years ago, I'm not going to use the P word so we don't get, uh, uh, we don't get uh, censored, but that did drive an entire super cycle of PCs, right? We had a growth that we hadn't seen for a decade and it was awesome. And then it stopped, right? And, and now, you know, the PC industry is looking for more use cases to get uh, people excited. I think uh, the full rollout of Windows 11 in the enterprise is going to do that. I think that the um, improvements we need to make to hybrid work is going to drive that in the enterprise, but scratching my head on the consumer side, maybe it's going to be the AI PC. It could be, right? If uh, if Microsoft and its partners uh, do their work and, and make uh, investments, it might be uh, the different form factors. I think what, like we've seen with the uh, Samsung uh, foldable, it, it's very expensive, uh, but it is taking customers away from Apple. Probably the only thing that's taking customers away from Apple on the smartphone side. Uh, I want to see this. HP, please send me this. Uh, I'd love to see it. <laughs> um, send it to him after you send me one, please. <laughs> We're not competing, but, you know, uh, Pat, look, I love a good geeky device. My historic best social post ever was when I showed off a large form foldable um, device at CES last year. And I said, I want one. And I think it got like a million eyes on it. So people, people societally love cool yeah, that was form the factor devices. You know, we're entering the era of foldables. You and I both uh, have or use one of these somewhere along the lines. Uh, you have been a better user than me. I still haven't quite found full utility, but I love the idea of more power and less space. So this makes a lot of sense. Um, HP, you know, continues to, you know, blend its, uh, you know, continuum of entry level, high volume Chrome based devices all the way to very high end um, devices. And the company has made some strides in terms of earning market over the last few quarters and has shown some um, some of its wares on the premium end of commercial devices. And this is where I'd say this sits. Um, Pat, I, I think we're going to see this year at CES a lot more. This is going to be a big thing. Like last year, it was a little thing. This year, it's going to be a big, big thing. Foldable is becoming more practical, more realistic. I mean, heck, I wouldn't even be surprised to see a foldable iPad at some point. I know, I know. It's weird, but... I could just see it making sense because you know who wants a eight inch when you can have twice that no, real estate. I needed to do the math. There was eight times two. Is that how it works? I don't know. Anyways, um, so you know, for me, these kinds of things to really be able to give a great assessment, I need to touch it, feel it, use it. I like what you said about the peripherals. I think at that price point, it needs to include it. Pat, I don't think these kinds of things come inherently. So. This is a what I'll put on our list of six, five items. This is a more to come from me when I've had a chance to kick the tires. But Pat, I am excited about these form factors. I am excited to see some innovation in the PC. And of course, with the uh, AI PC on the horizon, I'm interested in seeing how new form factors plus more on-device AI could maybe really shake up the industry and create another super cycle of growth long-term. Okay, I'm the host, sorry. All right, so last topic, Apple, oh God, I love it. <laughs> Apple's spectacular failure to replace Qualcomm. Now, this is not your and my headline. Exactly. This is the Wall Street Journal's headline. And Apple and Tim Cook must have been absolutely, uh, what would I say, pleased, ex excited, staggering happiness after it saw this title. Now, well, how funny is this, though? This is written by Aaron Tilly, and we saw Aaron the week before. So he's literally like conjuring this, and we're talking to him, and he's not giving up. You know, he, he didn't bring this up to his uh, his credit, but good job, Aaron. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and, and, and this was a piece that, you know, a few weeks ago, Pat, the announcement that Qualcomm got the big contract from Apple came out. And this kind of happened in a really busy week. This was the ARM week. This was Apple's new launch week. This was... 
So it kind of got a little bit muted in the middle of that, but this was a multi, multi billion dollar deal for a Qualcomm. It gave some additional legs. Qualcomm had been trying to convince the investor class that losing Apple was going to be something it was prepared to do. And it was, but how much better for a Qualcomm if it can keep providing to Apple for another two to three years? It's three years in the contract. Um, and you know, in your in my opinion, when they first came out with this news at the end of their long settlement after Apple tried to sue Qualcomm into selling itself to Broadcom, that's not exactly how it happened. But you know, if you piece it all together, they were trying to weaken Qualcomm substantially and then basically potentially maybe see it sold to a company they had a better <laughs> relationship with. Again, speculation. I'm putting that out there, lawyers. I'm just saying. Um, but Long and short was you and I both said, Pat, it ain't happening. They're not going to get this done. You know, Qualcomm, um, sorry, Apple bought, what was it, Infineon? Uh, Intel. Well, Intel, oh, Intel Infineon bought Infineon, Infineon business, which was the business at Intel that was supposed to be able to build the 5G modem. That was the split um, in, in Apple's last 4G phones. They were able to buy that in split. But throughout that entire time, the Qualcomm part always outperformed the Intel part. And as that transition to 5G got closer, Intel's group could not make it. So Intel ended up having to shed that business on a fire sale to Apple with the hope that Apple could bring these resources in and ultimately figure out how to uh, build this 5G RF system that has proven to be nearly impossible. Now, this article, Pat, basically exposed, and it was reshared all over the internet, that effectively it's been a quote unquote spectacular failure. And this goes back to 2018 was when this really started. So we're not talking five years. And the idea was, is Apple believed it could make more money if it could build its own chip like it's done in so many other parts as it's tried to vertically integrate. This is the Tim Cook special. And basically what's ended up happening is with a few parts from namely Qualcomm and Broadcom, it's either been determined they can't do it more efficiently or they can't do it at all. And so in this case, this is the, we can't do it at all. Um, you know, they were trying, Pat, right up to the deadline of last year, this phone was supposed to be the first one that had this new Apple part. And not only, they couldn't make it small enough and they couldn't make it perform. So these things were overheating, they were too large, they were non-performant. And effectively, Apple had to go crawling back to Qualcomm, begging for its part, <laughs> which was super interesting, Pat, because this could this had to be an absolute nightmare for Qualcomm or for, in Jesus, an absolute nightmare for Apple, Pat, are we the are we the are we the pilot or the passenger? <laughs> What's going on here? Um, oh, no, and in the end, you know, now what's happening is Apple's got chips that are probably three to maybe even five years behind when it comes to an RF modem system, and we're looking at 2026 or later before uh, Apple's going to be able to make its own part. Having said that, Pat, I will say, while I was a hundred point. 1% sure that they were going to have to come back for this round. I do feel the next round, I will be surprised if they have to come back again. This is my early prediction, but over the next three years, I'll be surprised if they aren't able to make this happen. So I know we're coming on time, but I am going to get my fill here. Yeah, I've got them. I'm, I'm not, I'm not rushing. Not, so go. So go. I told you so not you, Daniel, but everybody out there. In 2019, I said this was going to be a stretch. Intel was 18 to 24 months behind when they bought this. And my statement was, how much money and how long to catch up? It took Samsung and Huawei eight years to fill the field a competitive motive, and they own the network, okay? They bet the network. never was that competitive. Right, and the game changed. Right, it's not just a modem game. It's a it's it's a it's a five G modem plus RF game. That's what I said, July twenty fifth, twenty ten nineteen. Now, I never said they couldn't do that. I said it was going to be very, very painful uh, uh, to get there. And let me just take a quote from uh, for, from this article. The engineering teams working on Apple modem chip have been slowed by technical challenges, poor communications. And managers split over the wisdom of trying to design the chips rather than to buy them. So they don't even have internal alignment on the strategy, Daniel. Now, that could be between the semiconductor folks and the iPhone folks, okay? Because the iPhone folks, they want a competitive motive, 
right? And they want to maybe save uh, a little money. But Apple is notorious. And yes, I've been recruited by Apple uh, uh, before. I didn't take the job, by the way. Um, I never said that publicly, but there we go. Um, and they operate in hives. And these hives don't talk to each other. They're not allowed to talk to each other, but that's also one of the ways that Apple gets secrecy. Uh, you cannot do a modem by being secretive and being in your pods and not talking to each other. So Intel's way of doing work does not apply uh, to doing modems in this case. Here's the other thing. There's, I think, yeah, four to, to four modem uh, vendors. You have to invest in research. Do not confuse research with research and development. Research is 10 years out. You are defining the telecommunication standards in 10 years. If you're not investing in that and you're not in the standard, you will be late. Uh, so how is Apple, who doesn't uh, take front and center on these standards boards, because they're secret, but modems can't be secret. They have to communicate with everything. And it's not just 6G. It's 6G, 5G, 4G, 3G, 2G. These, these systems have to interoperate. You have to be able to make a phone call on a 2G network, not just stay in this network. So there's historical baggage, which I think they got from Intel, but there's also the testing that you have to do and the trade-offs in the RF. And that RF subsystem needs to talk like five languages at the same time. Uh, so what's my final point? How long is the board of directors going to let this lunacy go on, right? I think there were, there were quotes around, I'm paraphrasing, Apple hates Qualcomm, right? But when does common sense and pragmatism come in and say, you know, this just isn't worth it. I need to put these thousands, I mean, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of resources on maybe making a better processor or a GPU or an NPU. Intel and Qualcomm and AMD are after uh, Apple on all of this uh, other intellectual property uh, and, and processors. But board of directors, investors, uh, this isn't a spectacular fail to replace Qualcomm. Not my words, Wall Street Journal, Aaron Tilly. I'm going to leave it at that. And we might, based upon historical commentary, agree. We might. Pat, did you get your fill? I did. Thank you very much. I feel better. Thank you. you. Feeling good? You feeling I am. Great? Favorite part of the week is now over. I'm sorry. It's okay. There's nothing else today that's going to be better than this last hour for you. Yeah. I just want you to know that. This was the best hour of your day. It is. I always say that. And it was the best hour of mine. And I hope it was the best hour of yours. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Hit that subscribe button. Join the 6-5 for all of our podcasts, events, on the road. We appreciate all of you out there in this community. But for this week, for this show, bye-bye now.